Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Wynnum. I work at Moffitt Cancer Center as a gynecologic oncologist. The main gynecological cancers include uterine cancer, which is the most prevalent, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, and vaginal cancer. Signs and symptoms of each cancer can vary somewhat. For uterine cancer, the most common symptom is bleeding, bleeding that's abnormal, usually after menopause, or bleeding which is abnormal sometimes in premenopause women, those who have not yet had menopause, um, especially if they have certain risk factors. The most common symptoms of cervical cancer include bleeding, but more commonly, for women who go in for their pap smear screening, an abnormality in their pap smear which leads to the diagnosis of cervical cancer. Ovarian cancer, there are a lot of subtle signs and symptoms, and it's kind of known as the disease that whispers. There are many of the same symptoms that you might have that don't represent cancer, such as bloating, early fullness when you eat, uh, gaining a little extra size in the waistline, um, some crampiness, constipation, those types of problems. When that happens, it's important to try to differentiate the difference between a cancer or what's much more common, non-cancer. Well, we are coming to a better point of understanding of what causes many types of gynecologic cancers. For uterine cancer, one of the strongest risk factors is actually being overweight. So a woman who is more than 50 pounds overweight can increase her risk of uterine cancer by up to tenfold. And that's about three times higher than just taking unopposed estrogens if you have a uterus. For other women, there may be a risk factor of some types of hereditary genetic problems, the most common one being something called hereditary non-polyposis cancer syndrome, or Lynch 2. These women have a high chance of having endometrial cancer, which may be up to 80%, along with colon cancer and some types of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is usually caused uh, by a lifetime of, of a lot of ovulatory cycles. So the more ovulations a woman has in her lifetime, the more likely it is to develop ovarian cancer. Now the things that increase ovulations are fewer children, uh, a longer time of menses, in other words, early onset of menarche at an early age or um, late menopause. Um, the, the absence of the use of birth control pills, the absence of breastfeeding, those things contribute to that. There's a small set of women, about 1 in 10, that have some sort of hereditary gene that puts them at higher risk of developing ovarian cancer, and that risk can range anywhere between 20 to 40 percent depending on the exact genetic risk. This is typically known as BRCA, uh, hereditary type cancers. Uh, for other cancers like cervical cancer, we know that most of these are related to a, to a virus called human papillomavirus. And there are many different types of this virus, but some of them can be more uh, apt to cause dysplastic changes, which are precancerous growth and actual invasive cancers. So typically this is dealt with by screening for this and trying to prevent cancers from developing in women. Well, the best screening option is just to maintain your regular gynecologic healthy exams. So there are good guidelines now on how women should be followed with pap smears for cervical cancer, the follow-up that should happen with abnormal pap smears, and women who are going in and having regular gynecologic care should be evaluated for abnormal bleeding symptoms or for problems during the menopause which might signify some sort of risk factor. Unfortunately for ovarian cancer, we do not yet have a good screening test. In certain high-risk populations, we do try to do some screening, but with limited knowledge about the actual successfulness of doing so. There are other options for these women, such as preventative measures that we can use that we do know the effectiveness. I think with any illness that you're diagnosed with, it's always best to see a specialist who deals with that from the very first. And, and, and the reason why is it's easier to deal with things correctly the first time than it is to try to repair or, or try to recover um, uh, from treatment which may not have been optimal in the first place. For gynecologic cancers, I think the obvious choice is a gynecologic oncologist. 
their subspecialty training just specifically focusing on these types of cancers. This field was developed so that women would have one physician and not be divided up among di many different types of specialists, so we take care of all aspects of a woman with a gynecologic cancer. Um, and you should, you should seek out that opinion early in the course when there's a suspicion that you may have a gynecologic cancer. I think one of the most exciting things about my job is that the field is changing so quickly. There's many new developments that are happening in gynecologic cancers and cancers in general. One of them is our deeper understanding of what makes these cancers develop and how we can specifically target these cancers. One thing that we know is not all cancers are the same. Not all patients are the same. Not everybody responds the same way to treatment. By defining what makes these cancers different, we're finding ways to target those specific cancers and individualize treatment for our patients. I think one of the things often overlooked by many patients when they're getting care is to consider the opportunity for clinical studies. Clinical studies are well thought out studies that have to pass many different levels of review, including scientific review and ethical review. And the reason they're being offered is because what we standardly have is not perfect. In fact, we have much room to improve in many aspects. So what it gives a patient is an opportunity to try good science-based new methods or new treatments because, because there's always standard options available. But considering a clinical trial earlier is better because later on there are fewer numbers of trials to be eligible for.